All right, let's get some polar and parametric. Then we got this miscellaneous topics video, and then we've got them all. And theoretically, we've covered a lot of stuff, so let's do the thing. Uh, we're doing polar and parametric in this one. We start off with parametric because polar tends to rely on parametric ideas. Uh, the big things here are speed and total distance traveled. So remember, speed, what we're going to do is we're going to take the square root of dx dt squared plus dy dt squared. So that's speed. Now if you remember back to one-dimensional uh, motion, if we integrate speed, we get total distance traveled. All right, so let's integrate speed. Now we've got total distance traveled. Fantastic. Um, arc length is basically total distance traveled. The only thing is, you could do it the way that I've written it here, or maybe they give you a function that's y equals something of x. So like maybe we've got y equals x squared, something like that. So in order to get the arc length in that case, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to take the integral of the square root of 1 plus dy dx squared dx. So that could come up as well. Either one of those would do that. Um, and then dy dx. Um, is just dy dt over dx dt. The second derivative thing gets a little funky. Um, that's where we just take the derivative again with respect to t and divide by dx dt. So it'll be d dt of dy dx and then we divide by dx dt. That's the second derivative when we're in parametric. All right, so let's start doing some problems. Let me switch back over to my black pen. All right, a curve is defined by the parametric equations x of t equals 3e to the 2t and y of t equals e to the 3t minus 1. What is d squared y over dx squared in terms of t? So what is the second derivative? Oh, that's the last thing I was talking about, wasn't it? So first let's find dy dx and then we'll find the second derivative. So dy dx, we're going to need dy dt, which is 3e to the 3t, and then I'm going to need dx dt, which is 6e to the 2t. So then dy dx is going to be 3e to the 3t over 6e to the 2t, which I can go ahead and simplify as 1 half e to the t. Okay, now if I want d squared y dx squared, I need to take the derivative of that 1 half e to the t and divide by dx dt. So The derivative of 1 half e to the t is 1 half e to the t. Now I divide by dx dt, so I divide by 6e to the 2t. And that's going to end up leaving me with 1 over 12e to the t when I do the simplification. Hooray! Next, uh, for time t greater than or equal to 0 seconds, the position of an object traveling along a curve in the xy plane is given by these parametric equations. At what time t is the speed of the object 10 units per second? Okay, this is a little different. They're not asking for the speed at some time t. They want to know what time t gives you a certain speed. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the square root of dy dt squared plus dx dt. That made way more room than I wanted for this line. And we're going to set it equal to 10. So that's the square root of t cubed plus t squared plus t squared plus 3 squared equals 10. Now this is a calculator section of the test. Um, if you didn't know that, then you weren't paying attention to your proctor, or you weren't paying attention to the fact that the answers are all in decimals, and this is a horrible, horrible nightmare to solve. Um, so you just plug that into your calculator and solve whatever way you'd like to. I like to move the 10 over, and then graph, what I'd end up doing is graphing uh, t cubed plus t squared plus t cubed squared plus 3 squared minus 10. I like to graph that equation, that I've, the expression that I have on the left, and find the zeros, but whatever you're most comfortable with in order to solve. I, I know that we all have a bunch of different ways we do that. Um, the answer for this one turns out to be 1.813. 
A uh, particle moving in the xy plane has velocity vector given by v of t equals that thing. For time t greater than or equal, what is the magnitude of the displacement of the particle between t equals 1 and t equals 2? Okay, well, first I should probably find the displacement vector. So I'm going to get a displacement vector. I'm going to call it d. And in order to get displacement out of velocity, I just need to integrate. So the displacement vector is going to be the integral from 1 to 2 of e to the sine t comma the integral from 1 to 2 of 5t squared dt. So I'm going to do that integral and then remember to get magnitude we basically are doing Pythagorean theorem. Let's call this x, let's call this y. I'm going to do x squared plus y squared and take the square root. So you'll do those two integrals whatever their answers are, Pythagorean theorem. It, and uh, you end up getting 11.954. The position of a particle moving in the xy plane is given by the parametric equations x of t and y of t at which of the following points x comma y is the particle at rest. Okay, so in order to do that, first thing I need to do is figure what time is, is the particle at rest. So the time that the particle is at rest I need it to be neither moving in the x nor the y direction. So I need dx dt and dy dt to both be zero. So I need to find when that happens. So first thing I gotta do is find dx dt. 3t squared minus 6t. I'm gonna set that equal to zero. Factor out 3t. So t equals zero and two. And then when I go over here to dy dt, get 12 minus 6t, set that equal to 0, and you end up with t equals 2. Okay, so apparently t equals 2 is the winner because that makes it both moving and not moving in either direction. So t equals 2 is what we want. Now I just plug into the original expressions to get the x and y. So x of 2 is 2 cubed is 8 minus 3 times 4 is negative 4. Oh, I, that already got me my answer. It must be A. Uh, to make sure, I could plug in the Y, and if I do, I get 24 minus 12, which is in fact 12. Perfect. At time t, the position of a particle moving the xy plane is given by the parametric functions x of t, y of t, where dx dt is t squared plus sine of 3t squared. The graph of y consisting of three line segments is shown in the figure above. At t equals 0, the particle is at position 5, comma 1. Find the position of the particle at t equals 3. Well, I can get the y-coordinate really easily. I just got to look at the graph. At t equals 3, we're right here, so y is 0.5. That's pretty easy. In order to get the position for the x-coordinate, I've got a rate. I'm going to integrate and add the initial condition. So x will be equal to 5 plus the integral from t equals 0 to t equals 3 of t squared plus sine of 3t squared. And this is where Mr. Vebert hits pause. All right, two things. One, I got the answer for x. Number two, while I was gone, I realized y should have been negative 0.5 because I'm below the x-axis. That was silly. Uh, and then x equals 14.377. So then the position of the particle is 14.377, negative 5. Now, negative 0.5. Now, remember, I've said this a million times throughout these videos, um, I have to write that integral on my paper. I can't just do it in the calculator and that be sufficient. I need to write down what I've actually done. You, can't, you need to show the grader that you know calculus. So make sure you do that. Uh, find the slope of the line tangent to the path of the particle at t equals 3. Okay, slope of the line tangent. That means dy dx. So I need to do dy dt over dx dt at t equals 3. Well, at t equals 3 for at least dy dt, I'm right here. I need to find the slope of that line. Well, it goes up 1 and over 2. So that's 1 half for dy dt. For dx dt, all i got to do is plug in 3. So let's go in here, let's do 9 plus sine of 27. And 
and that's 9.95638. If I do 0.5 divided by that answer, you get 0 0.050. That's it. All you had to do is dy dt over dx dt. We found dy dt graphically using rise over run. dx dt, we just plugged in 3 to the dx dt equation they give us. Be careful to not take an extra derivative because they're waiting for you to then make that mistake. Uh, find the speed of the particle at t equals 3. Okay, so speed of the particle, that's going to be square root of dy dt squared plus dx dt squared. Well, we just found dy dt. We know it's 1 half. So square root of 1 half squared. And on the previous slide, we also found dx dt is 9.95638. So then that ends up being the square root of 0.25 plus 9.95638 squared is 9.969. 9 Crazy, right? It's going so many nines. All right, last thing. Find the total distance traveled by the particle from t equals 0 to t equals 2. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to integrate speed. So it means I need to integrate the square root of dy dt squared plus dx dt squared. But if I look at y, what I notice is its derivative, its slope, is going to be a piecewise function. Right here, I've got a slope of negative 2. But right here, I've got a slope of 0. So what I have to do is I have to break up this integral that I would do. I'm going to have to do the integral from 0 to 1 of the square root of, so we said that was negative 2 for dy dt, so 4 plus dx dt squared. And then I also have to do the integral from 1 to 2 of the square root of, well, the slope from 1 to 2 for y is just 0. So 0 plus dx dt squared. I need to find those two integrals independently and add them together. And what I'm going to end up getting by doing that is 4.350. Again, that's just plugging everything into the calculator. That's all there is to that one. It, it, it's not as horrible as it looked. You just have to be careful with the fact that you do, in fact, have to break up the integrals because dy dt is not a consistent, uh, consistently defined thing. It's piecewise defined. All right, now let's look at this one. The shaded region in the figure above is bounded by the graphs of y equals x squared minus 1 fourth and y equals 1 16th minus x to the fourth. Which of the following expressions gives the perimeter? So perimeter, I'm thinking kind of like an arc length thing. So a distance traveled around this space. So for this part, I'm going to end up using the 1 16th minus x to the fourth. I need to take the derivative of that. Don't forget to take the derivative. Uh, so the derivative of that is negative 4x cubed. And then dy dx for this one is just 2x. So then I'm going to do the integral from negative 1 half to 1 half. The square root of 1 plus negative 4x cubed is going to be 16x to the 6th when I square it. Plus the integral from negative 1 half to 1 half. Square root of 1 plus 4x squared. And that would be it. Now you notice though, that's not an answer choice. So what we can see is this half, these, this can be perfectly split in half. 
there's symmetry. So if I integrate from zero to one half and multiply by two instead, I should get the same answer. And that's what they did in the answer choice. So that's how we get C for that one. All right, let's talk about polar. The big things on these is area. Uh, you're gonna you're gonna do it within a single curve or contained inside of two curves. Uh, dy dx relating to parametric. Something that I should have put on here as well. Uh, remember, x is r cosine theta, and y is r sine theta. So that's how we're actually gonna get dy dx. We're gonna take dy d, d dy d theta over dx d theta. I don't know why it took me so long to come up with that. Um, and as often as possible, we're just going to do it in the calculator because usually they want it at a point. They're not looking for a function. And usually it's on the calculator section that they even ask for that because it does become quite cumbersome quite quickly. All right, let r be the function given by r of theta equals 3 sine theta on the interval 0 to 2 pi. The graph of r in polar coordinates consists of two loops. Find the rate of change of the x-coordinate with respect to theta at the point p. Okay, so that point P could either be theta equals pi halves or theta equals three pi halves, right? Because if R was negative, it would stick up. Um, so what I can do, though, is I can look at the way R of theta is defined. And if it's three pi halves, it should be a much larger quantity. So that's why it does, in fact, uh, P is, in fact, theta equals pi halves. So now all I have to do is find dr d theta evaluated at theta equals pi halves. And I can actually do that in my calculator because this was on the calculator section. So that's what I'm going to do. And then I hit, and that goes ahead and equals 3. So just plug it into your cal calculator. The hard part on this one is finding what theta is. Uh, find the area of the region between the inner and outer loops of the graph. Okay. So in order to find the region between the inner and outer loops of the graph, we're going to have to do some integrals. Okay, so what I have to do first is I have to figure out what I'm actually looking for. So what I want to do is I want to find the area of this whole region. And then I want to subtract the area of this region here. So to find the area of the blue shaded region that I just did, I need to figure out what the bounds are. So I know this is going to start at zero. The first time that this is going to go back to zero would be whenever sine is zero. So the area of the shaded region is going to be given by one half the integral zero to pi uh, for r, r of theta squared. So that's how I get the area of the shaded region. Now, when I, if I want to get the area of the entire black region, which would include the blue and the overlap, I'm going to end up starting at pi because that's where the first loop left off. And then I'm just going to go to the end of the bounds. So it's going to go pi to 2 pi r of theta squared. Now, I know it might look a little weird, um, like, why don't you just combine them? The reason I can't combine them is because the bounds are obviously completely different. So give me about half a second and I will have an answer. Okay, so when you actually put those integrals in, making sure you don't forget the squares, making sure you don't forget to divide by 2 at the end, you end up getting 139.528. Now I want to go back to this other problem for a second. Because while I was gone, I realized I misread something. This says find the rate of the change of the x-coordinate with respect to theta. I just did the rate of change with respect to r, the radius. So this is a not correct. What I actually need to do is I need to find a function for x of theta. Well, that's just r cosine theta. So that'd be 3 theta sine theta cosine theta. Now I'm going to go back into my calculator. I'm going to evaluate the derivative at theta equals pi halves. And then you end up getting negative 4.72, 712. Okay, so make sure you don't make the mistake I just made and actually read the question. Okay, so we've got that, we've got that. Now let's look at the function r satisfies dr d theta equals 3 sine theta plus 3 theta cosine theta. Find the value of theta 
that gives the point on the graph that is farthest from the origin justify your answer. Okay, so I've got a closed interval and I wanna find a maximum. I'm gonna do the candidates test. I know two of my candidates already are zero and two pi because they're the endpoints. Okay, so now what I have to do is I have to find the zeros of, of DRD theta. I'm gonna do that in the calculator. I'm not gonna try and solve that analytically. I'm just gonna go in there, graph it, find the zeros. I think that the easiest way to do that is not in the polar coordinates. I would switch back to my standard function format for this if you had switched to polar in the first place, which you probably haven't at this point. Um, I would make sure that I'm looking for these zeros in the function notation rather than do it in the polar. So give me a second to find those zeros and I'll be back. Okay, while I was gone, I went ahead and filled out the entire chart. I found the zeros analytically and then I plugged theta back into the original R of theta. Now, carefully reading this, it says farthest from the origin. So it doesn't matter if the value of R is positive or negative. I'm just looking for the biggest one. That's this one right here. So the value of theta that gives the point on the graph farthest from the origin will be 4.913. That's my answer. The table is sufficient justification. Um, it would be useful probably to go ahead and say um, DRD theta equals zero is how we got those. Uh, just to show a little bit more ideas of where these came from rather than just let them magically appear. But I think they actually would cut you some slack if you didn't write that on this one. Okay, this is the last thing I want to look at with polar and parametric because it pushes parametric inside of it. Um, the particle moves along the polar curve, r equals 4 minus 2 sine theta, so that at time t seconds, theta equals t squared. Find the time t in the interval 1 to 2 for which the x-coordinate of the particle's position is negative 1. Okay, so first thing I want to do is I want to find an equation that gives me and the x-coordinate. Remember, x equals r cosine theta. So for us, that's 4 minus 2 sine theta times cosine theta. Now we want this to be negative 1, but we don't want theta for it. We want to find t. So instead of theta, I should be putting t squared because theta is equal to t squared. So I want negative 1 equals 4 minus 2 sine of t squared Wow, that was horrible. Who's letting me write? I don't know why they're doing that. And that, now that I've got that written on my paper, I'm going to go ahead and go into the calculator and figure out the answer. Okay, so that ends up giving us t equals 1.428. Okay, if you need to write any of that down, pause the video real quick because I'm about to erase this whole thing. Okay. Okay, for part C. Part C says, for the particle described in part B, find the position vector in terms of t. Okay, well that just means I need the x-coordinate and the y-coordinate. Well, I had the x-coordinate on there a second ago. It was 4 minus 2 sine t squared cosine t squared. And then similarly, the y-coordinate would be 4 minus 2 sine of t squared sine of t squared. There's my position vector. Now, in order to find the velocity vector, I'm just gonna go in my calculator and use the derivative at a point feature. If you have an 84, you're using n deriv, and I'm gonna find the derivative at t equals 1.5. So that's gonna give me a negative 8.072, comma, negative 1.673. That's it. I wanted a velocity vector at t equals 1.5, so I found the derivative at t equals 1.5. Okay, now this is a little bit long. We got that polar stuff, we have that parametric stuff, uh, but there it is. Hopefully that helps.